hopefully today after this presentation, you'll be able to take away the following. So what is this thing called a mathematical function? How do we write out or define mathematical functions? What is the notation? How do we determine what a function looks like? What are different types of functions? And hopefully give you a better understanding on why they're so important. What is this thing called a function? So the formal definition of a function is it's a mathematical relationship or a rule between a set of inputs and a set of possible outputs. So I personally like to think about a function like a machine where we give it some sort of name, let's say F, and we put things into the machine, some magic happens and it spits out something new. So let's say that we have, you know, some uh, element or something that's going into this function. Okay, some magic happens to it and it's going to spit out something new. Now, when we say the set of inputs, a set is just a thing to refer to, um, like a mathematical set is basically just a grouping of certain things. But where our inputs come from, that is referred to as the domain. And the things that the function spits out, that is referred to as the range. Now, you can see that the range is in this green thing called the codomain. We'll talk about that difference in just a second. Now, the notation for a function. Now, notation itself should make our lives easier. It does not change the function itself, but it helps us better understand and explain the relationship between the input and the output. So let's say our domain, let's give it a name, A. Let's call this thing the codomain B. We have some sort of input that lives in A. It's going to go into our function, and the function is going to spit out something new Usually it's called f of x, sometimes it's called y. This is just a naming convention. And then in terms of how we write it or define the function, we have the name of the function itself, that's the f, and we could have called it f, g, smiley face, whatever you want. The a here tells us where our input, or sometimes known as our independent variable, comes from. And then B is telling us um, where the dependent variable lives, specifically uh, where the range is contained. And that little arrow there, that just means mapping. It's a fancy term that we use saying that we take our X and then it gets mapped to our range, which lives in B. So a natural question, what is the difference between this codomain and range? So let's say that we have some function, we're going to name it f, and it's going to go, it's going to start from the integers and go to the integers. That's what that fancy little z means. And it's defined by this rule f of x is equal to x squared. Let's say that we pick x is equal to 1 and put that through our function. So what our function does is it squares it and then spits out our answer. 1 squared is 1. If I put a negative 1 and I square it, I get the same output. So what types of numbers do we get out of this? Regardless if they're positive or negative, they're all going to end up being positive in the end. So we would say that our output, our range in particular, that's the positive integers, but the codomain is integers. So they're not always equal. When they're equal, that's a special case um, that's related to when you can go backwards with your function or taking the inverse of a function, but that's for another time. All right, graphing functions. So a function graph is just a visual representation of a function to see the relationship between our inputs and our outputs. So let's say you have no idea what a function looks like. You can use a thing called table of values to organize what your inputs and outputs would look like. Sometimes these pairs are referred to as ordered pairs. So let's say that you have this function, it's called f, it takes something, multiplies it by a half and then adds two to it. Once we fill out our table, we can then plot the points on the Cartesian plane and then connect them. So once we filled out this table, we then know what this line looks like. 
And let's say this is a test question or an assignment question, and if I asked you to do this, it's very important to label your graph to say what the function is called. And the arrows just mean that it continues on. All right, different types of functions. So there are many different types of functions. We cannot go through all of them. Um, but depending on what you're trying to model or describe um, around you, you would use different functions to do that. So one that we already looked at is uh, a linear function, the equation of a line. And don't worry about the stuff too much in gray. We'll talk about that in a second. Another example that you've probably seen is a quadratic function or a parabola which looks something like this. And these are both examples of a general type of function called polynomial functions. Another function that we've all probably heard of because of the pandemic are exponential functions. And another really important function, especially for healthcare, are periodic functions. So a function that if you add on a certain number, it is equal to the same thing as it was earlier on. So let's look at these a little more carefully. So linear functions. So this m here, this is just a number. This is referred to as the slope of the function. The b is known as the y-intercept, so it's where it crosses the y-axis. And our x here, this is our variable. So when you see this in English, it's pronounced f of x, the thing on the left side. Whatever's in those brackets, that tells you what the variable is. So let's say we look at 2x plus 1. So that means that our uh, function is going to have slope 2, so if you move over 1 to the right, you go up 2, and then we take this line and we shift it up by 1. So it looks something like this. Now our quadratic functions. Now this a, b, and c here, these just represent numbers, okay? Sometimes they're called scalars, sometimes they're called constants. And again, this x here, this is just our variable. So let's say that we consider the function where our a is 1, our b is 0, and our c is negative 1. This is a type of parabola. It looks like a bowl. You've probably seen examples of this before, but it looks something like this. So it's a standard parabola. It's called just the x squared part, but it's shifted one downward. Now, as I said, these are examples of polynomials. Now, a polynomial, uh, again, these a's here, these are just constants. And again, our x is, this is the variable, but a polynomial is just this expression where you have variables to the power of something. And this n here, this tells you the degree of the polynomial. So our line, for example, that was called the degree one polynomial. The quadratic equation, that's called degree two. But you can have cubic ones, you can have to the power of four, to the power of five. Depending on their power, they're going to look different. And polynomials are so important because they allow you to take any curve that you see and approximate it by a function of this form. Exponential functions. Okay, this a here again is a constant, but in this form it's sometimes also referred to as a base. And then again, our x's are variable, and in this form it's also referred to our exponent. And the bigger your a is, the faster your function is going to increase or, or get bigger. So you can see here 2 to the x compared to 10 to the x, they change very differently, but they still have similar shapes. And anything to the power of 0 is 1, that's why they all go through the point 0, 1. Periodic functions. So this a here, this constant, this is also, uh, for these functions, referred to as the period. So the period at which a function repeats itself, or sometimes we say completes a cycle. And again, our x is our variable here. So the ones that you're most familiar with, or you've probably seen before, is sine and cosine. Okay, These waves that just kind of repeat themselves. But there are many other periodic functions or combinations of periodic functions. So putting different ones together that can give you these uh, very nice sort of shapes, uh, but they repeat. Okay, applications of functions. So functions are important mathematical tools that let us model or analyze information data within various different fields. So healthcare is a big one, technology is a big one, including gaming, and business is another uh, big one. And just to give you a couple of examples, in healthcare, for example, functions let us model the relationship between 
different variables. So for example, if you're trying to see how people get sick over time, or how when you give somebody a medication, how the concentration changes in the bloodstream, or BMI calculations. These are examples of things that are defined by functions. In technology, um, so within science, engineering, and physics, for example, we use functions to model motion of an object. So say you're moving in a car, your, uh, where you're driving, your position, that can be described as a function. And then you have your velocity that you're going and your acceleration. Those are all written as formulas or functions. Same thing with electric circuits or properties of material, or if you're um, writing software algorithms, those algorithms depend on functions because there's certain relationships between things, between variables. And business, an example that you've probably heard of is uh, modeling the stock market prices, or if you're trying to start up your own business, um, revenue or costs, these can, can be described by functions as well. So let's just do a quick example, um, just so hopefully solidify a lot of these things. So let's talk about the spread of influenza. Okay, so let's say that we have this function, its name is P, uh, where P of X just tells you the number of people that are infected, and that X here, this represents time in days. So when people get this flu, the number of people getting sick, it can be described by this function here. We want to plot this and see where the peak occurs, when we expect the most number of people to get sick. Okay, so we can do our table of values here. And I just want you to take um, about a minute to try to fill out a couple of these. Now, X um, refers to time in days, so it doesn't make sense to take a negative X. The first thing that we can take is zero, because we can't go backwards in time. Uh, in, in certain fields of math, you can, but that's a discussion for a different day. And then you don't have to check, you know, day one, day two, day three, so on and so forth. You can just, you know, check every few days or however many points you want to. Okay, but we notice that if we check in intervals of 10, that after 20, the numbers start going down. Now, realistically, a way that you can find the peak, this is one way, but we have other more powerful tools, specifically in a field called calculus, that would let us find this out uh, much quicker and more precisely. The numbers are kind of made here, so it's easy for you to see it, but if it's a much more complicated function, we would use other tools to help us with this. But now that we have this table of values, uh, we can plot what this looks like. Okay, so we're just going to do intervals of 10 here on the x-axis, and then we'll do intervals of 100 on the y-axis, and then we're gonna plot these points that we have, and once we have them all plotted, we're gonna draw a line that connects them. So we can see that our peak corresponds to x is equal to 20. So what does that mean? Uh, the peak, the most number of people to be sick is expected to be on day 20 with 300 people being sick. Okay, so in conclusion, so math empowers us to analyze and interpret information or data to make informed decisions and to optimize processes. And functions themselves are a powerful tool that allows us to do this, allows us to model and analyze this data. They can almost be thought of as the bridge between math and the world around us. Plus, they can be used to describe pole dance moves. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time.